The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands and decrees and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction that you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are on the furthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling place for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favour in the presence of this man. I was a cupbearer to the king. In the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of the heart. I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, What is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favour in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, How long will your journey take, and when will you be back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set the time. I also said to him, If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so he will give me timbers and make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my requests. So I went to the governors of Trent Euphrates and I gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night I went through the valley gate towards the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem which had been broken down, and its gates which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on towards the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The, official, the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had not said anything to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we're in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they, and so they began this good work. 
But when Sambalat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Amen. And God will bless mm -hmm. the reading of his word. You just want to keep reading on and on and on, don't you? Because you, oh, it's like the opening, opening scenes. You know, this, the man called Jacob Dylan, he was the son of Bob Dylan. Do you remember Bob Dylan, the singer? Yeah, a few people know who he was. Um, he actually, um, Jacob Dylan leads up his, um, the band called the Wallflowers. And uh, he found early on in his career that whenever he had a, a uh, what they call it, a tour, and, and he had an audience, it would be filled with middle-aged people with letters for his dad. Because actually they couldn't access his dad. He had no fan club and so they would give him letters. And in an interview he was asked about it and he said it was really frustrating. He said because you know people have written books about my dad. They've even talked about how his music has changed culture. And so he's in history books even. He said and so many autobiographies have been written. He said but the trouble is there's only ever one page in any of these books that give reference to his family. He said and the thing is I don't want to be a page in a book. I thought it was very significant when I read that because identity is so very, very important to everyone, isn't it? And it's an incredible fact, you see, that humanity, no matter what the circumstances, needs its identity. And this, of course, is a fact of life and history. We need to know who we are. And often we have to assert who we are, but life isn't always that fair. And our identity is something we have to learn to practice in order for it to make, it make sense and work it out in our daily living. So if we were to read, for example, Romans chapter 8, we would see the clear choice that we have as Christians to make about that. The fact that we don't live alone. The fact that we can live in relationship to God and participate in a divine nature. Now here in the text, the people of Israel were actually in a terrible state. They had no identity. Around 250 years before, the Babylonians had invaded, they ransacked, they destroyed the city, they desecrated and destroyed the temple, and they took the population into slavery. Those with most promise with a profession, those people who showed any um, ability, uh, were led out and they were separated. And then all the people were taken to different parts of the kingdom so that there was no way for these people to regroup. I know this was what we were called ethnic cleansing at its best, or its worst. I mean, at least they actually took some people into captivity and retrained them, um, not like the ethnic cleansing we see today. The young people in particular were renamed and they were given a new identity. And this is very illustrated well for us in the life of Daniel. Let me read a passage from Daniel chapter 1, just a couple of verses. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah... Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. I love that passage because what it says there is actually, in spite of the fact that they were overthrown, God was in control of this still. Along with some of the articles from the temple of God. And these he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put it in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well informed, quick to understand and qualified to serve in the, queen, in the king's palace. Men beware. Obviously we show... No, no, no. Mm. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Now among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Now this sort of behaviour won't come as much of a shock to us as we see similar things happening in the present world. In the recent past, we've seen the Bosnia War, the Kosovo Crisis, the anarchy in Zimbabwe, the war between Ethiopia and Eritrea, and that's just a few. In the present day, in, in Iraq, we've got ISIS, 
We see ethnic and religious struggle as something that's acute because it speaks of them and reveals the need for identity. And if we were to go back the last 500 years or so, we would see the horrors of the great British Empire and similar colonisation by the Germans and the French of the African continent. And further back, the Spanish and their behaviour, particularly in South America. And most recently, the two world wars and an untold amount of other local wars and skirmishes. You see, this is the evil that exists and has accompanied humanity since the fall from God's presence in the Garden of Eden. And we see the effect of that evil as the whole tactical exercise of divide and conquer found its way to be in the most effective method of controlling the victims of war. But as we come back to the text, eventually we have to understand that the Babylonian Empire was actually overthrown by the Persians in 539 BC. And they allowed people groups to return to their home countries and even practice their own religion. But although 50,000 were released, a vassal ruler, that is someone who is loyal to Assyria, was placed in power over them. And a further condition of release was that the menfolk, in a time of crisis, would be liable to call up. Now, since the Babylonians had invaded, those who had been taken were long since dead, and those returning were those who had had the heritage passed down to them by their parents and their grandparents. The information they had was quite scant. They may have heard the odd prophecy, but for the most part, there was just stories of their history. And that's why it's so important, as we read for the Old Testament, how, how the Jews celebrate the feast every year. It's because they remind themselves of their history. And that's why we, as God's people, should perhaps celebrate these things as well. Reminding us of the history of God's people. How God has redeemed his people. Because no matter what, no matter how far away we seem to be from our own people, how far we seem to be away from our own identity, God is in control and reminds us constantly of the heritage that we have. The cultural understanding, these people that were re re returning, was far from Jewish, although despite the indoctrination of cultures they'd been brought up in, the history that was passed on from generation to generation remained with them. And so there was a, an essential, what I would call an essential identity, those seeing them returning must have thought they were a group of foreigners. And I've got this picture in my head. I know it's a, perhaps a cartoon picture, I don't know. But there's this signpost at a crossroads that says Jerusalem this way. Okay? And suddenly all these different people from different parts of the kingdom turn up dressed in all different manner of clothes. Their skin is different colours because obviously they, they've changed. And they actually speak different languages. And they find a way of communicating. And then they find out... <laughs> that they have God in common, they have the same faith, and they come together to start the march to Jerusalem. Can you imagine what that must have been like? When you think of the, the children of Israel when they were taken into the wilderness, do you realise, so it's a bit of an aside here, but there were three, they estimated three million people went out in the Exodus. If you put these three million people side by side, that would be a queue of 150 miles. That's a lot of people. Now, we're only sorting 50,000 here, okay. But it was still a lot of people. And imagine what it must have been like as they exchanged stories. And suddenly, in a different language, someone else knows my story. Maybe songs, maybe they sang together. As they, oh, what a day it must have been as they returned. And those seeing them return, they must have thought they were really strange people. And the first thing they did when they got there was set about rebuilding a temple, which was, of course, central to their worship. Let's honour God here. This is a focal point of our identity as the people of God. But they soon became discouraged and they gave up on the project. And 16 years later, God sends the prophet Haggai in. And he went to minister in Jerusalem, and his, his ministry was one of challenge. The problem was, you see, that as they gave up on the project, because building homes is easier than building a temple, their focus went from the temple onto their homes. And they were beautifying their homes, but building a temple slipped and slipped and slipped. And it remained in ruins. <coughs> and after the first group of return, more Jews were allowed to return in 458 BC. Now, I don't expect you to know all these numbers, okay? But if you want a copy of this, it's available to everyone, okay? 
And that swelled the numbers to around 70 to 100,000 people. And so by the time we actually get to Nehemiah chapter 1, Ezra is discouraged because 90 years have passed since the exiles began to return and relatively little has been achieved. In fact, the report that comes to Nehemiah is not a good one. Look at verse 1. In the, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel, Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. And they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. <coughs> Clearly there was a need for God's people to regain their identity. Nehemiah was a slave. He had a responsible position, and he was obviously an able guy. He was a man who was concerned for his people and their identity as the people of God. And I suppose in the same way that colonial life sharpens identity for the expatriate, the exiles like Nehemiah were just fiercely loyal to God and his people. And they wanted to maintain the history. And they saw the enormity of the task as they thought about it. And they imagine what the journey must have been like. All these people returning, we've talked about them singing, imagine the images in their minds, what it, what's it going to be like when we get there? They had all these stories, and they've been taught from generation to generation about the greatness of God, about the greatness of the nation. And imagine when they arrived and all they saw was a pile of rubble. All the promise, all the expectation, all the hope seemingly dashed away. Well, the situation facing Nehemiah, you know, is a picture that we have for us today. Look at 3b, look. It says here, the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. All that time since people have been coming back, 90 years, and nothing had been done. They had nice houses. I'm sure they have views across the rubble. But they got so used to it that they just carried on amidst the rubble. There was no sense of victory, there was no sense of purpose, no sense of identity, no sense of hope there. They live for themselves and their own. During the conflict in Bosnia and Kosovo, in Serbia, in Chechnya, in Gaza at present, in Ukraine, in Iraq, Afghanistan, and you know, even in some of the housing estates up and down our own country, there's this need to f physically rebuild homes and other buildings, but more importantly, we need to rebuild lives and community. There is now, you know, more than ever, a crying need for identity, and we as Christians have the answer in Jesus Christ. And now more than ever, we need to exercise our identity in the face of society that actually does what it wants. With political leaders who dance to a particular tune, not because it's right, but because of the promise of power or supposed prestige. We are the people of the living God. And we are duty bound to protest against the evil and the injustice in the world for righteousness sake. We have to say something. We have to say this is not good enough. And it would appear that the problem that God has with his people now, as he did with them, is that he just can't seem to get through to our hearts so that we see things the way that he actually sees them. We don't feel with his heart. And instead of acting, re re reacting appropriately in the face of the cold wind of declining standards and the change within the world, what do we do? Well, we button up our spiritual overcoats and accept things that are the way they are with an air of in inevitability. What will it take for the Christian church to get angry in the right sense? To be willing to stand up against this prevailing tide of decline and say enough is enough. You see, modern thinkers, they've just rejected the very idea of objective morality. Darwin, who reduced morals to an extension of animal instincts. Freud, who regarded repression of impulses as a source of neurosis. There was Marx, who disdained morality as an expression of self-interest. Well, I'll tell you something in the light of the wisdom of these great men. Just look at the world and the state we're in. 
And what does Nehemiah do? Well, I'll tell you what he does. Look at verse 4 and chapter 2. Then I prayed to the God of heaven. You know, this brings back images of Daniel, doesn't it? This identity, when we see through God's eyes, when we feel the pain of his heart, look at the society in which we live in, a week that so many have lost their way. How do we feel when we watch the news and we see a photograph of a murder victim? When we see the reports of famine and the images of starving infants looking at us, of the pictures of war zones as we take another bite of our sandwich. Are we not, are we not outraged? This was never the way it was meant to be in God's creation. Or are we just glad that whatever is happening is not happening to us? <coughs> the challenge, you see, is surely that if we don't feel this way, then we need to re-examine our own discipleship. Because our identity as Christians is proven by the way that we respond in faith to the burdens that we have. Our faith and our identity, you know, it's, just, it's more than just a feeling of security for ourselves. When we enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, we open ourselves up to responsibility for caring for the whole world. We might feel physically unable to do anything, but I'll tell you something, we can pray. All of us can do that. We can all give, and some of us can actually go and render assistance. Now Nehemiah was conscious that he was not a free man. He understood that there was nothing in a practical sense that he could do. But the burden for the reputation of God and his people, it was so heavy on his heart that he stepped out in faith and he asked God to do the impossible. Look at chapter 2. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought to him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I'd not been sad in his presence before. Good job, because he could be put to death for that, by the way. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of the heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And the king says, so what do you want? That's unheard of for a Persian king. And he starts, doesn't he? He's a wise man, Nehemiah. May the king live forever. He's obviously a man of good reputation. He's a man who's loved by the king. And as he comes in and serves him often, he doesn't say a lot, just does his job. And he noted, he was of note, that he was sad. And he senses that this guy is hurting. And he actually asks the question. And when he asks the question, he gives the answer. And the Holy Spirit goes in and convicts him. And before he knows it, he opens his mouth and says, So what do you want me to do? What do you want, Nehemiah? And then there's what I like to call an arrow prayer. I love these. Then I prayed to the God of heaven. As a simple believer, he asked God in the face of all the possible consequences of speaking to the king. Okay? He knows he could die. So he spent time in prayer for this. Okay? He's prepared. He steps out. And it's as if he was saying, Lord, I know that you're a God of promise. And I know that we as your people have let you down and we fail time and again. But Lord, will you let me do my part? You know the king's a pagan. You know he's not an easy man. And you know he's put others to death on a whim. So would you give your servant success today by granting him favour in the presence of this man? You see, this is faith. He takes all those fears and he strangles them. And moves from being afraid of an earthly king to suddenly having confidence in God. He may in a physical sense be a slave to this earthly kingdom, but here we have a man who is free in his heart because he's a slave to God. And this describes perfectly, doesn't it, that we as Christians need to, to, need to hear this challenge because in this maze of conflicting desires and standards in which we exist, we move our position to being more afraid and influenced by the rulers and the opinion formers of this world rather than of God. In faith, we need to break out of this mould. 
We have allowed ourselves to become captive to it, you see. And we've, be, we've lost the, the purpose of becoming the radical movers and shakers that we're meant to be. And we're supposed to stand confidently for the cause of Christ, insisting upon righteousness in whatever sphere we find ourselves. No, I won't do that. Nehemiah's life, you see, it reveals a secret. His life is couched in prayer. In a moment of stepping out in faith, being able to switch between conversation with a king and prayer. How easy would that be? Has anyone here got an MBE, OBE or anything like that? Who's met the queen? Anyone met the queen? No, nor have I. Well, she's not met me yet. Okay. But could you imagine being in the presence of the queen and you're, you're thinking about what you want to say and you, know, you want it to be a nice occasion, but you want to pray for her? Do you go to, to, go to her and say, really nice to meet you here, Majesty, can I just pray with you? No, you don't do that, do you? You are not allowed to put your hand out to the Queen. She has to put her hand out to you. Did you know that? That's a part of security. So as she offers her hand and you want to pray for her, can you, ex can you say, well, it's really nice to meet you, Mum, but at the same time do an arrow of prayer? That's where we've got to be. That's exactly where we've got to be. You know, when I was away in France, I met a, a new chaplain with the um, 1st Regiment Royal, Royal Horse Artillery. A lovely, lovely guy. He's a Methodist minister. And he's all new to it. He's brand spanking new as a chaplain. And he's so keen, you know. But he's really quite nervous about the job he's doing. He's actually, he actually used to be a ballet dancer, would you believe? You know, amazing. He's had the regiment doing ballet dancing on the square. Amazing. <laughs> But, you know, I was under a conviction when he was talking to him. I was just absorbing his, his enthusiasm. It was great to hear him. And uh, I just felt myself, I just wanted to pray for this guy. I actually found it quite difficult because I was just wanting to more and more and more from him. But I was able to say, do you know what, Darren? I'm going to pray for you every day for six months. And I, you know, I've been doing that, and it's been great. So liberating, I've been able to pray for But that's where God wants us to be. He wants us to have lives that are counseled in prayer, who are listening to his spirit, so that when we feel a burden for someone, we act on it. We don't just say, well, if I can fit it in. We don't do that. We just do it. The real lesson, you see, is obvious, isn't it? Before we move and face any situation in life, we have to give God his place and we have to seek him in prayer. That as we move on, we're consciously seeking his will for our lives from moment to moment. We're not saying to him, this is my decision, Lord, please bless it. But please, Lord, what is your plan and may I take part? And the reward for Nehemiah's faith is that he gets permission he needs to proceed. Look at verses 6 to 8 in chapter 2. Um, six to eight over the page. Here we go. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, How long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, If it pleases the king, may I have letters for the governors of Trans Euphrates, so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah? And may I have a letter for Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so that he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel? and by the temple, and for the gate of the city wall, and for the residence I'll occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my request. Isn't that fantastic? Not just with permission, but with letters, with timbers for the gates of the city, a house to live in, cavalry to guarantee his safety, and God, you see, is not a God of half measures. <coughs> God honours this man because he simply asked if he could play his part. Nothing is impossible with God. We limit ourselves so easily and all we've got to do is ask. And why do we worry about the consequences? Because he'll give us the strength to do it. He'll give us the provisions to do it. And he'll give us a way to do it in a way that only we can. And that should really encourage us, particularly as we feel that we're not physically as able as we once were. So, he says to the king, will you give me a holiday on full pay? Letters for the forester, material for the gates, the temple and the house. Oh, and also letters for the governor of Trans-Euphrates, etc., etc., etc. And then the king says to him, um, when will you get back then? So, I set a time. Who's in control now? 
Do you not see the humour, the irony in this? It's a fantastic story. As God just takes a whole situation, throws it up in the air and it comes down and Nehemiah's a winner. This isn't a game of chance. And all of this because an ordinary believer just stepped out in faith. A man who understood his need for identity as a child, hidden and protected and kept by God. Listen to this. How lovely is your dwelling place, says the psalmist. O oh Lord Almighty, my soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. You know, even a sparrow has found a home, and a swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. Lord, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. That's where we've got to be. So there was a need for identity. But there was also a real need for authority in all this. You know, it's great, isn't it, to see God at work. Always great. But we need to backtrack just a little bit to see Nehemiah's need for identity was actually conditioned by his need for authority. Of course it was an authority proceed, but before that there was a clear need for him to come to the place of repentance. And it's interesting, Joan mentioned that. She didn't know what I was going to say this morning. You mentioned that this morning in your prayer. About exactly the same thing. Look at verses 6 and 7 in chapter 1. Let your ears be attentive to your uh, attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, laws, and laws you gave to your servant Moses. Days passed before he approached the king. But first of all, there was a recognition that the walls of the city were in ruins because of the behaviour of God's people. You see, they disobeyed God's law. And this was conditional. If you remember back in 2 Chronicles, if I can find it, here we are. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Do you remember at the installation of the temple and the dedication of the temple? And all the great promises of how the land would be theirs and how they would be the nation of God. And how when Solomon is in prayer and God speaks to him and says, but if you turn away and forsake the decrees and commands I've given you and go off and serve other gods and worship them, then will I uproot Israel from my land, which I have given them, and will reject this temple which I have consecrated for my name. I will make it a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. And although this temple is now so imposing, all who pass by will be appalled and say, Why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this people? And people will answer, Because they have forsaken the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of Egypt and have embraced other gods, worshipping and serving them. This is why he has brought all this disaster upon them. Not only had the nation deprived themselves of the presence and the blessing of God, but also by their actions they deprived the world of the light of God too. We are meant to be stewardships of the, stewards of the salvation that we have. We have a stewardship and a responsibility to the world that we live in, and we deprive the world if we don't share it. And in his confession, Nehemiah, as a member of the chosen nation, owns his part of the responsibility because it belongs to him he's inherited that the identity of the people of God you see is more than just a building and it's about the things that we do it's about who we are and by ignoring this fact they've been depriving themselves and everyone else of the presence and the blessing of God now this speaks right into the Christian church today and it's relevant to us as God's people now as Israel continuing the fact is, turn around, to turn around the church in our society. That can only come about if we acknowledge our responsibility for the walls that are crumbling. The church is a bigger concern than just our local situation here at Beacon North. I wish it were other, other than that, but it's not. I've got minister friends who publicly say they were called to a specific congregation. 
are specifically called there and so they won't join in any other group outside their own you know that's just parochial it's naive and it's escapist and it's certainly not the pattern that God intended for his church so questions need to be posed will we accept some responsibility for the way that we are Will we as a Christian community accept some responsibility for the way that the community is? Are we effective salt and light here in Gateshead and beacon off? See, the trouble is, so many Christians are pointing the finger and saying it's all down to the devil and someone else without acknowledging the sad fact that the nation is in the state it's in because of the state the church is in. We've only got to read the press. Really, this morning, do you see the walls crumbling with our obsessions with celebrity and sport and conquest and money and fame? Well, as we read through the book of Nehemiah, we can't avoid the fact that the buck stops here. And this is the place where we need to start rebuilding now. You know something? When Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem, he surveyed the work to be done. Look at verse 11 through 15 in chapter 2 there. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few men. I would not told anyone but my, uh, what my God had put in, the heart, in my heart to do for Jerusalem, and there were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night I went through the valley gate towards the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on towards the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there wasn't enough room for the mount to get through, so I went up to the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered the, through the valley gate. Now, there will be a map next week, and I'll, I'll show you some of this and give you a description of where we are. Um, and I wonder, just as I was thinking about Nehemiah touring the walls, as he was trying to make an assessment of just the enormity of the task, I wonder if we've toured the walls of our lives, of our marriages, of our family life, of our church family life. I wonder where we find what we thought was strong, but reality are no more than piles of rubble there. So what kind of husband am I? What kind of wife am I? What kind of example do I set my children? What am I teaching them? What is our home like? What is my prayer life like? What kind of disciple am I? How about my giving? <coughs> am I devoted to the church family as I should be? What kind of things are we putting into each other's lives? Now, for, for years, many of us have refused to make any of this kind of inspection, believing that if we don't, it doesn't really matter because someone else is going to pick up the tab. God's word is that we are, are his people and we need with his authority to build in faith to understand our identity and understand who we are in Christ. We've got to stop mucking about, friends. We've got to stop the half measures thinking that we can make this a convenient stop when it suits us. If we are God's children and God's servants, it's not about pleasing the pastor or pleasing the membership. It's nothing to do with that. It's about serving God at 100% of the time. We don't need the slippery standards of the world. It's all or nothing. Our, <clears throat> our identity, our authority, the standards we live by, the walls of security we have as Christians have all got to be of God. Now this is the boundary in which we live. This is the city within whose walls we have to live. I wonder, are we ready to start rebuilding? Because I am. Mm -hmm. And we'll continue next week.